Hello, my name is Jan van der Vrane. I work as an historian at the World Heritage Institute in Brussels, but now we are at Dijksmuiden, which is actually here on the map, um, where the only Belgian trenches of the First World War are preserved. We will go through the museum and then we go into the trenches itself and we end with the German bunker of the First World War. In this small scale museum we have different parts. We have a part about the invasion of Belgium, the war in Europe and the Battle of the Iser River. Then we talk about the petrol tanks which were really cr crucial at this point. And now we will talk about life and death at the Belgian front. When Germany invades Belgium it was meant to uh, to get to France as quickly as possible. But uh, the Belgian army resisted more fierce than anticipated and in the end they had to give way and they came to this part of the, of the country and they tried to resist the German army at the railway embankment between Newport and Dixmuiden. And the river Iser was a very crucial factor in this defense as well, which we will see later on in the exhibition. These are the petrol tanks which were in German hands from October 1914. From these tanks, the Germans had a good view of all the Belgian positions and the Belgian army didn't like it very much. So they asked the, tro the troops, they tossed the troops to conquer these petrol tanks. And in the night from 9 May, 9, 8 9 May 1915, the Belgian army attacked those positions, but they failed. The night afterwards, they tried again, but they failed again, and again, and again. So the 12th of May 1915, yes, they decided, instead of attacking overland, we will go we will dig ourselves in and on the, other, at the banks of the river Iser we will make a trench towards those petrol tanks. And from that point onwards, this is the actual origin of the trench of death uh, from 1915 onwards until the point where we are today. In this display case we see uh, some of the defensive weapons which were used in the early stages of war in 1915 by the Belgian and German army in this area. The most important weapon uh, for defense is the, this German machine gun. It's the Maxim 08. Uh, it's a heavy water-cooled machine gun which could fire 600 rounds a minute. And two of, two of these machine guns, well placed, could stop an entire army from advancing. This is what happened in May 1915 when the Belgian army attacked the German positions. Two of these machine guns, together with artillery, stopped the complete uh, Belgian advance here in this area. Here you see a photograph again of the petrol tanks in German hands. This is the Iser River, which is really important. The Germans were on this bank of the Iser and also on the other side. The Belgian army was here where you see those sandbags and all the barbed wire, so the Belgian position. So they started digging the trench in the Iser dike in direction of the petrol tanks. But what happened? The Germans were doing exactly the same. They were digging from the petrol tanks towards the Belgian positions. So what happens when one party is digging towards the other and the other does the same thing, at a certain, po certain moment they will meet up in the middle. This is what happened on the 26th of May 1915. The German army was very close to the Belgian position and they attacked the Belgian head of the trench and they conquered it. And they kept there. And the Belgian counter-offensives all failed. So now Belgian and German soldiers were only a couple of meters away from each other. And this stayed there for a couple of months during the first months of 1915, during the summer of 1915. Here we see two different uniforms. It's a German uniform of 1915 and the Belgian uniform of 1915. In the middle we have this explosion device which was used to create a gap on the Iser Dyke on October 1915 uh, by the Belgian army because the situation got too, uh, too, um, too dangerous for its troops. Because in the beginning of October 1915, the German army attacked twice the Belgian position and we lost a lot of men there. On the 2nd of October 1915, the Belgian army lost 26 men on a small position, only a couple of square meters. Um, that's why they decided to make a gap in the Iserdijk um, to stop the German uh, attacks from happening. And this is why this device was used to let uh, um, explosive explosives do their work in this trench and from them, that point onwards the trench got a lot safer for the Belgian army. Um, this photograph was taken in the summer of 1915. The Belgian army uh, was re-equipped with khaki uniforms but the helmets only came from October 1915. This is a photo taken in, September, uh, in 
summertime 1915 at this spot in the trench of death. The trench of death was not uh, named uh, after the numerous deaths which, which occurred here. It was only named because some of the soldiers who were killed in May 1915 were left where they, where they died and only stretcher bearers a couple of days later uh, took away the bodies. But some of the soldiers um, who had to occupy these trenches found it very morbid and they called this trench the trench of death, named after a couple of people who were left behind. Uh, it has nothing to do with the number of that. Uh, this is actually a myth we have been able to debunk uh, a couple of years ago. So from October 1915, after the creation of the breach in the Iserdijk, of the gap in the Iserdijk situation, got more uh, solid here. There were lesser attacks, um, but there were still a lot of patrols, sometimes offensive patrols, even by the Belgians. They crossed the Iser River to blow up German bunkers, to take prisoners of war, to get information. And this is where this kind of material was all used. We've got this German and Belgian hand grenades. We've got this, um, this dagger, which was used for, of course, silent killing. We've got uh, a German gun, a Belgian gun. Uh, trench periscopes to look over trenches to, uh, to, to be safe. And very often those periscopes were um, marked by bullet holes because uh, snipers were always on the watch. Um, whenever a periscope appeared on top of a trench, they were aiming at it. Um, sorry. In this museum, we have uh, invested in a lot of screens where people can actually look up all the information in different languages, uh, for example, and a lot of photographs. Um, as we can see here, um, here we can see Belgian soldiers at the end of the trench of death resting. Um, they're not really in an offensive position because this, when, a mo when this photograph was taken, everything was quite calm on this part of the front lines, all quite on the western front, as they say. Um, we have photographs of uh, Belgian mortars in this trenches, trench of death. Um, the Germans re didn't really like this kind of weapon because it was very lethal. We have upon this is one of my favorite photographs. It is a aerial photograph of the trench of death. I will zoom in a little bit because the arrows are on, on top. Um, we are. We would be now standing here somewhere here. This is the actual trench of death, which can still be visited today. This is a so-called cavalier or the horseman's redoubt, uh, which is two-story defense line, which is still there today, which we can also visit. This is the famous breach in the Iser, made with the explosion device, and we have some German lines here and a German bunker, and that German bunker still exists today, which we can visit. And on the other side. This is the Iser River. We can see the, the landscape is completely destroyed by Belgian artillery. Because here we can see the remnants of a German defense line. And here as well. As well as here. Here it has been destroyed. And the petrol tanks used to be here. But from 1917 onwards, the Germans decided to destroy the petrol tanks. Because they, of course they're empty. In 1917, the German army destroyed the petrol tanks, because the Belgian artillery always fires at them. It's really visible in the landscape and Germans don't like it anymore. And the advantage of having the higher point is not a reason enough to keep those tanks. So they destroyed them in 1917. This are, these are the remnants of these petrol tanks, which still can be clearly visible on the photograph. This photograph was taken in Bopopan, the 14th of October 1917, during the, uh, the Passchendaele 1917 offensive by the Commonwealth troops. This is one of my favorite photographs. Um, we also have a blueprint of the trench of death made in 1918. A new division uh, took over this sector and wanted to make some adjustments on the uh, to the trenches. So they asked their um, engineer department to make a blueprint. Um, which was kept in the archives by the Belgian army. If we can zoom in, we can see all different spots um, of all bunkers which, which uh, are available at that time. For example, this one was made of concrete blocks. Uh, an upper level is a small shelter and it's very heavily damaged. But if we go to the trench of that itself, we can see this one. Uh, concrete blocks and it has been completely destroyed. This one is uh, 2 meters by 1 meter 90, the height is 2 meters, 
concrete, the uh, walls are 40 centimeter thickness, uh, the roof is 60 centimeter thick and is in good condition. And it has a firing slit for forward firing. So all these little bunkers in this trench are being um, inventorized, inventorized. All these places, you can still visit them in a trench today. Okay. <clears throat> this display case shows all kinds of headgear worn by both Belgian and German soldiers. On the left you have the Germans, on the right you have the Belgians. Uh, the photograph on top shows Belgian soldiers on the end of the Belgian trench and the photograph below shows German soldiers on the end of the German part of the trench which is quite a unique view. We have both parties almost at the same spot, almost at the same time during the war. Because in this museum we don't only tell the story of the Belgian army, but we also try to tell the story of the German army. That's why we also included the German bunker into the site a couple of years ago. We have also some artillery pieces on display, because next to the patrols on no man's land and blowing up bunkers and trying to get some prisoners of war. On a daily basis there are a lot of artillery duels. When one shot was fired it was answered by two shots. When two shots were fired it was answered by four shots. And in the end nobody knew how the artillery duel came into existence. A lot of people died here on site, both German and Belgian side, by these artillery duels. That's why we also have put some artillery grenades on display, both German and Belgian. These two typical uniforms are the yeah, typical uniforms of the Belgian and German army from 1915 onwards, of 1916 onwards. On the right hand side we have the Ger um, Belgian uniform, it's a lieutenant of the engineers, because the engineers were really important here, there was a permanent um, presence of Belgian engineers. And left hand side we have these typical German uniform with the M1916 Stahl. Another screen talks about life and death in the trenches in, in, on the Belgian front. And for example, this photograph is also one of my favorites. This shows the effect of German shells on Belgian helmets. So helmets, they're meant, meant to protect people, but they were not always really that efficient. And these small display cases show a variety of material that is the Belgian soldier could have had in his, in his bag during the war. We have a souvenir from a clock, we have a watch, we have a, um, some religions, religious stuff, we have uh, needle and thread, we have gas masks, we have playing cards, we have toba tobacco, and all kinds of stuff to illustrate what a Belgian soldier could have in his bag. Now the trench of death, I already told you that the name didn't come from the numerous dead here. But we have managed to compile a list of people who died here. All these crosses illustrate uh, one soldier. I will pick up randomly one soldier. This is Victor uh, Deville. He died on the 2nd of May 1915 uh, near Milestone 16. The trench of death is built near Milestone 16. And his body was never found after the war. We'll take another one, just as an illustration. Um, this one was killed on the 2nd of October 1915, one of the 26 uh, people who were killed by the German attack on the, on the Belgian trench. He was only 19 years old in the moment he, he died. And his last resting place is now a Belgian military cemetery close by at Egerwaardskapel. This helmet shows also the effect in real life of a bullet, a uh, German bullet. Uh, which enters the right hand side and exited on the left hand side of the helmet. So, we will now go to the second floor where we have a panoramic view on the trenches itself. We're now on the second floor of the uh, small building here in the site. We have a large aerial photograph on the floor, so we can actually run on the trenches, both German and Belgian. So this is where the museum is. I'm standing right on top of the museum. In green are marked the Belgian trenches, and in red are marked all the German trenches. So on the other side of the Iser River, we have all the German trenches, which are here you can you can almost identify the German soldiers on the ground. It's nearly that good. You can see here a small rail line. It's a Decoville, small yeah 
rail line used for uh, transporting heavy goods. You can see here it has been destroyed by a Belgian bombardment, uh, an artillery bombardment. This is why this photograph was taken to see the effect of the bombardment. All these holes here are from shells which exploded in the no man's land, uh, no man's land in German occupied territory. You can see all the wooden debris lying everywhere. On the other side, we have the Bowser Trench, the Trench of Death, which runs here across this, uh, next to the Iser River, uh, just until the end, which this point is still visible today. Most of the points are still visible today. A bit farther away, we have the German bunker, which you can enter as well. You can very clearly see it has no actual roof because it's a, a machine gun bunker and it has to be very well uh, aired, otherwise people will suffocate. And it's still there today, this bunker. The petrol tanks, you can see them here. On the map, from the, the aerial photograph, are a bit farther away. They don't exist today anymore, but there's some large-scale monument has been made with the petrol, petrol tanks in scale uh, still visible today there. So it's worth taking a, a walk there. Um, most of the parties, you can actually compare this aerial photograph with the panoramic view we have uh, through the window here. Um, if, you com if you even combine it with the touch screen here, it's the same aerial photograph with all points of interest indicated. For example, the petrol tanks, we can all have seen, we can see all photographs which are available in our collection. Uh, for example, this one, it's a German photo of the petrol tanks completely riddled with, with uh, bullets and shrapnel from the Belgian artillery and Belgian guns. Um, and this is a post-war postcard uh, with the debris of the petrol tanks. Um, other points of interest are, for example, uh, this one. These are graveyard crosses, um, which would have been about 20 meters from here. Um, this is where also, also the, name, the name Trench of Death comes from, because these crosses were not identified. They were just people of the 9th Regiment of the Line, but were unknown. Um, this is the only photograph of this one. We have the opposite side. This is a German trench, the other side of the, of the Iser River, with an explosion of the Belgian artillery. This photograph shows the explosion of a Belgian grenade from Belgian artillery on the other side of the Iser River, on the German trenches, the Tranché Saint Onze, or the Werkschanze in German. Um, it was taken by a Belgian soldier with his camera on top of the, uh, top of the, the parapet of the trench. We have another one here, we can easily, very clearly see the Iser River, uh, the par Belgian parapet, and here the explosion of a pro probably a uh, large caliber of artillery uh, shell. Another one, and the effects of artillery on the other side of the uh, Iser River. It's not clearly visible in the photograph, but these are the German lines. So I propose we go into the trenches itself and have the nearly real experience of war. Any questions for Paul? No, we're good. No, okay. Thank you guys for watching our tour through the museum. The trench tour takes a little bit longer, so with time in mind, that'll be uploaded separately. It'll be uploaded next, too, so don't forget to come back and see it. There's a lot to see in this small museum. You could speed run it in less than an hour like we did, but I would recommend that you take about three hours total to go through all the information, see the presentations, like you can look through the images and extra info and all the people and the records on the screens and then go walk the trench. If World War One and trench life is a specific interest of yours, then I think you could probably spend even more time. They do have guided tours and schools come through, but from my opinion, what we saw is a really nice balance between original artifacts and images to see, and both are really well explained. You have multiple languages for visitors, Dutch, French, German, and English, so you can read along the exhibits and learn also. It goes without saying that there is a lot to see in this area. I don't think this museum can disappoint, so make part of your military history travel plans. Special thanks to Jan and to the War Heritage Institute for the tour. There are several sites in this museum system. They are very much worth the visit. 
Check out the links below and follow them on social media for their new exhibits and their expansion information, as well as info to plan your trips. Some exciting things are coming up. You don't want to miss it. Thank you for watching my video. If you dug it, toss a like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And I'll see you next time for some more history and uh, armored adventures.